Hello everyone, so today we're going to be looking at the explanations of attachment learning theory. As always, I'm following along with the AQA psychology textbook for A-level year one and AS with the green haired girl on. So the things you need to know and be able to recognise, your specification point states this, explanations of attachment learning theory. So you need to be aware that explanations of attachment actually refers to more than just learning theory. It also refers to Bowlby's monotropic theory. So if you get a question with that term of explanation of attachment in, it's referring to both Bowlby's theory and learning theory. But if a question specifically says learning theory in it, or it's specific to this Bowlby's theory in the question, it only wants that particular one, not both. So let's take a look at learning theory and attachment. Now, learning theory was put forward by Dollard and Miller in 1950. And what they did was propose that caregiver infant attachment can be explained by learning theory. And it's also been called cupboard love approach. And this is because their approach emphasizes the importance of caregiver as the provider of food. So they propose that children learn to love whoever it is that feeds them. So learning theorists take a look at attachment in terms of classical conditioning with the pairing of food. So if you think about the unconditional stimulus, which is our food, that leads to an unconditioned response of pleasure. Now the mother on her own towards the baby has no response whatsoever. There's no response from the baby. But when we then pair a neutral stimulus of the mother with the unconditioned stimulus of food, it leads to pleasure. And eventually over time, that repeated pairing of the mother and food leads to the mother being a conditioned stimulus, which leads to the conditioned response of pleasure. And that's how learning theorists would argue attachment is formed and it's through food. So we can also look at operant conditioning. So this is learning to repeat a behaviour or not depending on its consequences. Always think of the consequences that a behaviour can have when you think of operant conditioning. So that will help you to work out whether it's positive, negative or it's punishment. So if a behaviour produces a pleasant consequence, so that's something good, something positive, this is likely to be repeated again and again and again. And that behaviour is therefore reinforced. But if a behaviour produces an unpleasant consequence, so something not very nice, then it's less likely to be repeated because it's not pleasant. And operant conditioning can be applied to explain how crying leads to response from the caregiver. Because crying is reinforced as the caregiver responds with comforting social suppressor behaviours. So we can think of this in terms of a two-way process. Whilst the baby is reinforced for crying, so it gets comfort, the caregiver is escaping that unpleasant noise of crying. And therefore, there's this negative reinforcement because you're avoiding something that's unpleasant. You're reducing it by comforting the baby. And that reinforcing interplay of attachment strengthens it. So the mother is going to care for the baby. So it reinforces that process, which then strengthens the attachment that is formed. We can think of attachment as a secondary drive, so be careful here because we're not thinking of it as in terms of a primary drive. We're going to argue that the primary drive is food. So we've got this thing called drive reduction, and that's where an animal is motivated in a way that will satisfy biological needs. And once they're satisfied, the result is this drive reduction. It reduces. So hunger is primary drive, and that's an in, innate biological motivator. So we're motivated to eat because it then reduces our hunger drive. Now, Sears et al. 1957 suggests that as caregivers provide food, the primary drive of hunger becomes generalised to them. So attachment is actually secondary in this sense, because attachment is learned by an association between the caregiver and the satisfaction of that primary drive, which is the food, the hunger, reducing it. So we can now look at our evaluation. So we have some counter evidence from animal research. If you think back to Lorenz and Harlow, we can see that they saw that contact comfort was much more important than feeding. So evidence has revealed that young animals do not necessarily attach to those that feed them. So Lorenzo's geese imprinted before they were fed and these attachments were maintained regardless of who it was that fed them. And also if you think about Harlow's monkeys, they attach to a soft surrogate 
and that didn't have food in preference for a wire one that did dispense milk. So contact comfort was more important than food and attachment does not result due to feeding. So therefore humans must be the same because learning theorists would actually argue that non-human animals and humans are equivalents. We also have counter evidence from human research. So research with human infants shows that feeding does not appear to be an important factor in terms of attachment. So if you think about the Schaffer and Emerson study, which we've looked at, many babies develop a primary attachment to their biological mother, even though other carers do most of the feeding when they were looking at the babies. So it was in 39% of cases, the person who fed the infant was not the person whom they actually attached to. So what it does suggest, therefore, is that learning theory is oversimplistic. And it's a problem for learning theory, as this research shows that feeding is not an unconditional stimulus, so it's not a primary drive. Learning theorists ignore other factors associated with forming attachments. So research into attachment suggests that the quality of attachment is associated with factors like reciprocity and interactional synchrony. And they're quite complex behaviours, if you remember those. So the best quality attachments are with sensitive carers that pick up infant signals and respond appropriately to them. So if you think about that Isabella et al study, which we've looked at before, that is relevant there. If attachment developed as a result of this covered love idea, there would be no need for these important complex interactions. Yet we see them when we observe mothers and infants. And additionally, learning theory is very reductionist. And that's where you've got complex behaviour and it's reduced right down to the most minimalistic thing. So it tends to reduce complex human behaviour down to stimulus response bonds. So it's like the most simplest thing. And instead, attachment is likely to be determined by complex interaction between learned and inborn factors. So it's much more complex than these learning theorists are suggesting. A strength is actually that some elements of conditioning could still be involved. So learning theory is not completely irrelevant because what we are aware is that much of human behaviour is affected by conditioning. So the problem that we've got here is that feeding is seen as an unconditional stimulus, seen as being reinforced and it's a primary drive. Now, it's still credible that the interaction between the primary caregiver and the provision of comfort and social act interaction partly builds that attachment. And also the primary caregiver may be chosen through enforce reinforcement because they provide comfort. So there's this negative reinforcement aspect in terms of the crying, which we were mentioning. And there's also a pleasurable interaction, so positive reinforcement. So not all conditioning is irrelevant. And what we can say is that instead, attachment as the primary drive is more likely. It's more likely that attachment is the primary drive as opposed to it being secondary to food. It's more likely that food would be secondary, whereas primary drive would be the attachment. We also have a newer learning theory explanation. So this is Hay and Vespo 1988. And they suggest that there is a newer explanation for infant caregiver attachment. So they say we shouldn't really go along with learning theory that's too outdated. Instead, we should use social learning theory. So this is different to learning theory. And what does, would that say? So that would say that social behaviour is acquired largely due to modelling and imitation of behaviour. Hay and Vespo argue that parents teach them to love them by modelling attachment-like behaviours. So in families, you see the mother hug their own mother, so the child's grandmother, and then the child observes that and then models that behaviour. The parent acts as a model showing them how to display their own attachment behaviour. Um, so something like, that's a lovely hug. And that encourages them then to reproduce that. So we can say that consequently, social learning theory is more credible than early learning theorists, as it provides an explanation that explains attachment behaviour, whilst also eliminating the problem that we have with learning theory, which is linking between feeding and attachment. But we still come round to conclude that it cannot explain the complex behaviours of synchrony and reciprocity, and for it's still not the dominant theory of attachment.
So if we have a look at past papers, we have this one on a specimen first set, A-level paper one. So this says, briefly evaluate learning theory as an explanation of attachment for full marks. So this is all AO3. Now, you don't have to just have one AO3 point. You can have multiple here. And in terms of this, you can talk about strengths and limitations. So this is quite a comprehensive mark scheme, I think, for this question. And psychology does do this, it gives a lot of content that you can include. So limitations, reductionist. Now we focused on that. That is quite a nice one, a nice one to drop in there because of that stimulus response links and reinforcement. It's very, very reductionist. We've also got evidence used to support or refute the explanation. So think of Schaffer and Emerson. Now we haven't looked at Ainsworth, but we will be doing that in a different video. You've also got methodological evaluation of evidence must be linked to the explanation to gain credit. So make sure you are doing that, because if you don't, you're not going to get the marks and you'll waste time as well. And look, there's the strengths as well. So make sure you're just having a look through that. So another question you've got is an AS paper 1 June 2017. This is outline and evaluate the learning theory of attachments. This is your essay kind of style question. Now, because it is an AS paper, it's a four and four split in terms of AO1 and AO3. To get into that level four band, you need to make sure your evaluation is effective. Whereas level three, it's some effective evaluation. Level four, you've got to be accurate with detail. But level three is there's inaccuracies and omissions. So you just got to make sure that you're concise and clear. So here's your possible content and possible evaluation points. Have a scan through those. It is all that we've just been talking about. And if you look at the bottom, it says, do not have to include both classical conditioning and operant conditioning for full content marks. So it's only four AO1 marks. You don't want to spend ages explaining both here. You could get all four just from explaining classical conditioning if you did it in enough depth and also mentioned the drive aspect, the secondary drive and the drive reduction. That would be enough. You don't need to mention both. And it's really good that the mark scheme points that out for you. So we have this A-level paper one from June 2018. Now, this is a big 16 marker, the maximum marks of a question you can get. It's an application question. And you can see it says discuss the learning theory of attachment and Bowlby's monotropic theory of attachment. So you've got to explain both. Now, some students get confused about this because you've got to do a lot of jumping about. You've got to be mentioning your AO1 for learning theory, your AO2 for learning theory and your AO3, as well as do that for Bowlby as well. So make sure you're using that box to plan. So we've got here two mothers at the toddler and parent group are chatting. I always felt sorry for my husband when Millie was a baby. He used to say his bond with Millie was not as strong as mine because I was breastfeeding. I'm not sure, replies the other mother. I think there's something about a mother's love that makes it more special anyway. And so important for future development. So as you can see, the second sentence is pointing more towards Bowlby and that one about Millie is more pointing towards your learning theory because it's talking about feeding whereas the bottom one it's important for future development you should be noticing that, that is Bowlby there so here's your different levels have a little look through that because it's your big 16 market it is AO3 six marks AO1 six marks but four for the application here's your possible contents this is your AO1 that's just the stuff we've been talking about, but also monotropic theory. We've not mentioned that in this video, but check that one out for understanding on that particular stuff. And then you've got your AO2 and then possible discussion points. Discussion, that is always your evaluation. Here, if you have a look at the bottom, it says for marks in levels three and four, there should be a reasonable but not necessarily perfect balance between learning theory and monotropic theory. So this is why it's really important to plan before. You need to try and get an equal-ish balance in terms of this question because it wants you to talk about both. Don't go into so much detail about one that you run out of time for the other because then you're going to struggle to get in the higher bands. Okay, thank you for listening and best of luck with the rest of your revision.